They escaped the freedom-crushing cruelty of communism. Now they say that what they're seeing today in America looks a lot like what they remember when they were growing up. I'm Stuart Shepard, and this is First Liberty Live. Did you know we have an app that you can download? We know it can be hard to keep up with things online. So if you download the app to your phone, it's one of the easiest ways to keep track of our episodes. Each one will show up after the fact. You can't watch it live on the app, but you can watch it shortly after. And uh, you can also listen to it as a podcast as you want. Just go to, you can go to the App Store or Google Play, either one. Uh, look for First Liberty Live and download the app there. It will make your life so much better if you do that. Thanks for for being part of that. Hey, my boss, Kelly Shackelford, loves this book so much so that we all got a copy of it. And over the last few weeks, uh, several of us have been reading it together. And every Friday, we have a little book club lunch where we get together and talk about what we've been reading. And this week, I am cheating on my homework because I've invited the author of the book, Rod Dreer, to join us for a conversation this week. Hi, Rod. Hey, Stuart. Thanks for having me on. It is good to see you, and thank you for, for being part of this. I hope you're going to be helpful with me, so I'll sound like the smartest kid in the room when we have our next book club <laughs> meeting with all the nerds here at, at First Liberty Institute. Hey, let's start with the provocative title of your book. You called it Live Not By Lies, which is an uncommon phrase in English. Where did it come from, and why did you pick that for what you wrote about? Well, it came from the final communique that the Soviet dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn sent to his followers in Russia just before the Soviets kicked him out. And uh, you know he had been in the gulag and the prison camps for many years for opposing the Soviet government. And in 1974, when he sent this communique out, he told his followers, he said, listen, we may not have the political power to change things in this country, but one thing we can do is to refuse to acknowledge and live by the lies that they require us to live by simply being here in this totalitarian country. So he gave a list of practical things people could do. He said, we're not called to go stand out in the middle of Red Square and say what we really think, but at least we can refuse to say what we do not think. Um, he said, for example, don't participate in public events where the truth cannot be spoken. Huh. You know, Get up and walk out, things like that. And I, I brought that into the title of my book because, as, uh, as you said at the top of the segment, uh, the things that people who escaped communism during the Cold War and came to America, the things they tried to escape are actually starting to happen here now. And I think Solzhenitsyn's advice, as well as the things that these people who survived totalitarianism, the things they have to tell us now are really important as we deal with this soft totalitarianism emerging in our own country. I tell you what, we're all seeing it in the culture. But going through it categorically in the book and, and unpacking what it's all about was really helpful to me to realize how far down the road we've gone. So I'd like to go through the book. You, you've divided it into uh, two main parts. The first is called Understanding Soft Totalitarianism, which is uh, different than what they saw in the Soviet Union back in the day, but it still has its impact. What, define what you mean by soft totalitarianism. Well. Uh the term totalitarianism refers in political theory to a system in which there is only one ideology permitted and in which every aspect of life is made political. And our idea of totalitarianism comes from the Cold War, from the Soviet Union, from Stalinism, the gulags, secret police, that sort of thing, and from George Orwell's novel 1984, which featured that kind of totalitarian state. Well, we don't have that now here in America, so a lot of people wonder, why do you say totalitarianism? Well, I'll tell you. We have entered into a time in which uh, wokeness, the term we all use to describe like critical race theory, LGBT, gender ideology, et cetera, that, that large conglomeration of progressive ideas, that has become the dominant uh, ideology of America's elites. Uh, it doesn't necessarily own the government yet, but it has taken over every institution in this country. Started with the universities, went to the media, and is now in big business, in law, medicine, even the military. And they're all operating from the same ideological point of view. If you dissent from this point of view, you won't be sent to the gulag, but you will be marginalized. You could lose your job. You could fail to get another job. You'll be, you will be made into a pariah for, for simply dissenting. And uh, this is what we're seeing happen over and over and over again. Another aspect of it being soft 
is that it's all done in the name of compassion, of making places safe for marginalized people. And protecting and, the oppressed. I mean, they say that, exactly. that by oppressing us, they're protecting those who have historically been oppressed, traditionally exactly, oppressed. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, and they, make no mistake, they will use their power to, uh, to push all of us out of public life. It's happening more and more. Just uh, this morning as we're talking, I was writing about a candy bar commercial for Twix, which has a, a witch, an actual witch, protecting a gender fluid little boy from his bullies who tell him boys don't wear dresses. Well, the witch makes the, these bullies disappear. And, uh, it, you know, this is the sort of thing where it tells you that transgenders can turn to the occult to to protect themselves from people who say uh, there's a such thing as a gender binary. I, I wrote about this because it, it's a really small thing, but this is how soft totalitarianism works. They even make candy bars serve the ideological narrative. And uh, people don't recognize that this is happening all around us. They're going to completely miss the way this whole mentality, this wokeness is taking over. Yeah, and, and that we have cases that we are currently pressing here at First Liberty Institute, one where a couple of flight attendants were fired because they expressed a, an unwoke political position on an employee-only website. And it, it came out of their faith, which is why we got involved, because we exclusively do religious freedom cases. They both were expressing a, a point of view that comes out of Christianity, and they were fired over it. Mm -hmm. We're also currently representing 40 Navy SEALs who are, for religious reasons, not wanting to to follow the government mandated vaccine by following, uh, asking for, requesting uh, a legal religious accommodation uh, that will allow them to continue to serve in their position while not being vaccinated. But yet they're being threatened with punishment up to and including, I mean, if they follow all the way through, it could be a court martial, likely they would at least lose extra pay and that sort of thing. Precisely the stuff that you're yeah. talking about. And you know what, Stuart, one thing that makes conservatives, makes it harder for us to see what's happening is because if you're of a certain age, and I'm of that age, I'm in my mid-50s, you were raised in a period of time in which big business was considered to be the good guys, you know, versus big government, or at least they were considered to be neutral. Yeah. Those were the old days. Now, big business has lined up completely against uh, traditional religious people, conservatives, and has become the biggest and most effective advocate of wokeness and of soft totalitarianism. So uh, we conservatives have awakened very quickly into a brand new world in which all the institutions of this society are arrayed against us. Now, and, and to that point, because I've observed the same thing. Growing up, I mean, you and I, we're not far from the, being the same age. The, the government, you know, you're always a little suspicious of. And we knew that the, the, the left was taking over academia, trying to take over education, when they definitely had Hollywood and the music industry, okay? How did they manage to get control of all of these corporations and turn them away from a focus on just selling product to selling ideology? How did that transition take place? <laughs> you know, I'm not, not really sure, to be honest, but I think one thing that happened was that people like me uh, looked at all these radicals on college campuses and laughed at it, saying, just wait till they get to the real world. They'll learn uh, what's what. Yeah. Well, they actually ended up marching through the institutions, through human resources bureaucracies, first of all. And uh, as this woke ideology became the ideology of the American ruling class, the people who run corporations decided that they needed to be part of that, too, and sign on to it. So I think in the same way that in the 1950s, for example, you would have seen major corporations uh, being very pro-patriotism during the Cold War, now they have switched that same ideology to wokeness. And they consider this to be uh, being a good American is to be in favor of gender ideology, critical race theory, and all of this. And it, it, in this country where business where commerce in the market is so powerful when you have market forces going over to this soft totalitarian ideology it's incredibly difficult to uh, stand up to it the second part of the book is where i want to spend a little more time it's called how to live in truth i have a, a whiteboard next to my desk and i wrote a quote that's from the book that you, you said it was a russian proverb it says one word of truth outweighs the whole world uh, explain a little more and you've talked about this already why living in truth is so important for us right now today well because it's so difficult to say what is true and what isn't we live in a culture that has been that has 
decided that whatever you feel, your desires, your emotions, are the surest guide to truth and falsity. Well, that is a lie. That is perhaps the foundational lie of, of this whole soft totalitarianism thing. If we are going to resist these lies, these lies in power that are enforced by power, we're going to have to keep our eyes focused firmly on what is true and be willing to suffer for the sake of defending the truth. That is the key. This is what I learned from traveling over to the former communist countries of Eastern Europe and talking to Christians who stayed behind, who did not flee, who stayed behind and fought against totalitarianism. They said that, first of all, you have to be committed to the truth no matter what, and that means you have to be willing to suffer, to pay the price to live in truth, because only by being willing to pay the price and to be seen to be paying the price will your commitment to truth uh, be concrete. Wow. And that's a hard truth that, that you laid out really well in the book, and that is the idea that we can't hide. Uh, there is a tendency, I think, in much of Christendom today to think we'll just avoid, because we all know, I mean, when we start to talk about the issues that you're talking about, we recoil a bit because we think, ah, we don't want people to call us names. We don't want our friend, people to defriend us, on, on unfriend us on social media. Uh, you know, my employer won't like it if I say that. So we try to put ourselves in a little box to avoid it, but that's not helpful at all. And it's living a lie in our own lives when we do that. Yeah, and it's coming for you. You cannot hide from it. There's, I talk about in my book about this great movie that came out a couple of years ago called A Hidden Life, based on the true story of Franz Jägerstädter. Franz Jägerstädter was an Austrian Catholic farmer who lived with his family high up in the Alps in the 1930s. Everybody in town went to church, but when the Nazis came to town, everybody in town went over to the Nazi side, except for Franz and his family. And Franz was eventually uh, thrown into prison and executed by the Nazis because as a Christian, he said, I cannot swear allegiance to Hitler. Why this is so important to me, and I bring it up in this book, is that there has to be something about the way Franz and his family were living before the Nazis came that, first of all, enabled them to see Nazism as a lie, and second of all, enabled them to go against the entire crowd in their little town to stand against the Nazis. Note well that all the churchgoers in this town were easy to flip over to the Nazis. I think that we Christians in our country are going to find the same thing. A lot of people in our churches are going to say, why are you standing against this? Why can't you just you know, practice what some churches are calling pronoun hospitality? We have to be open to people. This is how the lie worms its way into our communities. If we're not already doing right now the things we need to do to identify the truth and train ourselves to stand for the truth, no matter what it costs us, we're goners. And that was a part of the book we talked about in our book club meeting last week, which is this, that family is one of the key institutions to pass along that cultural memory of who we are and where we came from. Uh, unpack that a bit f more for us, because what we're seeing in culture is so much of what's happening right now with mo woke culture is aimed and targeted directly at changing what the definition of family is to bust it up, to, to make it ineffective. Well, that's right. And we see happening in uh, these school board fights around the country, especially in Virginia, where the educational establishment is positing itself against families. You know, and thankfully in Virginia, people are waking up to it. Everybody needs to wake up to this across the country. But in my book, I, uh, I center that chapter on family on this one family in Prague, in the Czech Republic, the Benda family. Yeah. They were heroes of the anti-communist resistance. Uh, Camilla Benda and her late husband, Václav, they had five or six kids, and they knew that they had to raise these kids to live in truth. They were the only Christians, by the way, in the inner circle of Václav Havel and the other top dissidents. When those kids would come home from school in the day, and they had to go to the communist schools, it was the law, the, the Benders would sit down with them and help them unpack what they had seen and heard at school that day to help those kids learn to discern truth from propaganda. Boy, is that important. Yeah, it go ahead. That, that idea yeah. of discernment. Because we're going to hear it, but young people need to understand this is what I'm hearing. Let's hold it right. up against truth. Right. And, and the little kids, have, young people have no idea uh, what they don't have any ground from which to judge unless we give it to them. Secondly, Camilla Benda, the, the mother, it was so impressive. She told me that even when her husband was in jail as a political prisoner, she would read to her children two, sometimes three hours a day. I said, that's really interesting. What would you read them? 
she said I would read them uh, the classics, I would read the myths, the sort of things they weren't getting in, in communist school. And she also read them a lot of Tolkien. I said, oh, that's interesting, why Tolkien? Yeah. She looked at me straight in the eye and said, because we knew that Mordor was real. And I understood, Stuart, by what she was telling me was that her children, they couldn't understand what communism was. They couldn't make sense of all these complicated ideas, but they did know what Mordor was. They wow. didn't know what the Fellowship of the Ring was. And in this way, they prepared their moral imagination to understand what mom and dad were doing. And all these people coming over to the house for activism, to pray, etc., were all part of the fellowship fighting Mordor in their real lives. In this way, Camilla was explaining that we and our families have to prepare our children, prepare their hearts and their minds and their souls for this resistance. Uh, you also write, a person cut off from history is a person who is almost powerless against power. And you add to that, we have to tell our stories in literature, film, theater, and other media. So not only taking in the classical literature that teaches those greater themes, but also expressing ourselves through art is part of keeping the culture. That's right. And this, this is such an important point that came out of the dissident experience. They discovered that the totalitarians would, would try to gain control over their societies by erasing the culture's memory. People who knew who they were in terms of their national history, their artistic and cultural history, and their religion, they were harder to control. So if the totalitarians could erase this knowledge from common use, they would have in front of them a bunch of passive people who are willing to accept any lies. And this is one of the reasons why the, the strong resistance that they've put up against the totalitarianism involved culture, involved talking about books and literature and religion and music. Um, this is has to be part of our resistance. So many of us in America think that we can vote our way out of this, that if we just elect the, the right politician and get the right judges on the bench, everything's going to be okay. It's not that simple. We do have to vote. I, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't vote, but that has to be only one part of our resistance. So we got family, we got art, and now the third. I turn on my TV, the primetime drama, they've added a new character that's preaching activism at me from a point of view. I pick up my phone and the geniuses at social media have added an algorithm that helpfully adds a warning to the ones that they fact check, and then a link uh, to a page that explains the, the approved point of view that, that I should mm -hmm. be holding. Uh, you quote, uh, you said Vaslav, am I saying it right? I always Vaclav, want to say yeah. Vaclav. Uh, t you quote him and there he wrote totalitarian power has extended the sphere of politics to include everything, even the faith, the thinking, and the conscience of the individual. And you go on, the first responsibility of a Christian and a human being is therefore to oppose such an inappropriate demand of the political sphere, ergo to resist totalitarian power. Why is it that totalitarian governments always have to get rid of religion, of faith, and why is faith so effective a countermeasure against totalitarian governments? Because religious faith proclaims an order of truth that uh, the totalitarian government has to be subject to and can't control. Uh, and if people are religious, especially facing communism, which is materialistic, if people are religious, then they know the truth is not what the government is saying it is. They have, they have a, a vantage point from which to resist. And, uh, and if you are truly a religious person, you will be, will be prepared to give your life for that truth. This is why, you know, in the Christian tradition, we look back to our martyrs and the confessors as heroes of the faith, because they were people who were willing to suffer and even die before they would live by the lie that the government expected them to follow. And uh, that, this is why religion is so very, very important. And I would also say, from the point of view of the Christian religion, we know as Christians that if we suffer uh, faithfully, we unite our suffering to Christ, that the Lord will use that suffering in some mysterious way to rebuild his church and to redeem the world. Our suffering has meaning as Christians. If we're not a believer and we're suddenly being thrown into a, into a cell and we're being tortured and beaten, as happened to everybody who opposed the communist government, if, we're not, uh, if we don't think that that has ultimate meaning, it's going to be a lot harder to endure it. But uh, as a I tell the stories in the book, there are people who were believers who knew that even though everything had been taken from them, uh, their liberty, everything, that they had Jesus Christ. And that was the thing that helped them endure. 
Now, there was an idea that you expressed in the book that we discussed because we, we, it, it caused us to, to go, eh, I don't know, at first, and then we, we had to think about it and talk through it, about it, uh, talk through it a bit. And, and uh, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially you mm -hmm. say, we don't need to fight every battle. We don't need to enter every conversation. We need to be selective about when we bring faith into the equation. We're like, well, no, no, we should talk about it all the time is our first response to that. But you had a different idea. Unpack that a bit for yeah. me. Why is it important to choose the hill? Well, prudence is a moral virtue. Prudence is the virtue that teaches us how to exercise the other virtues. Uh, at First Liberty, for example, you can't take on every case that uh, appeals to you, people asking you for your help, because you don't have unlimited resources. So you have to make the choice between when can you do the maximum good by taking on these particular battles. It works the same way for all of us in everyday life, especially in a case, uh, in a situation like we're in, where as conservatives and as religious conservatives, we are weak and going and apparently going to get weaker if you look at the trend lines. So we have to be very careful about using our limited firepower. We have to try to do the most good with it, whereas our opponents have almost unlimited firepower. They hold all the high ground in the culture. They have all the resources. So uh, we can't hope to beat them by taking them head on at ever on every front so we have to fight uh, what you might call a guerrilla war against uh, to try to prevail against an o the overwhelming power of the enemy that's all i mean there I, it's not a council of cowardice it's a council of wisdom yeah. I, one final thing for you to reflect on before I let you go. I so appreciate your time today. Uh, you wrote this. You say, you have to live in a world of lies, but it's your choice as to whether that world lives in you. Reflect on that thought. Yeah, I, I'm simply saying that we can't necessarily change the world around us. We have to try, but we, we're not going to do it, not right now, in the short term. The only way that we will ultimately ultimately be able to prevail is if we preserve our, our inner conscience and our minds and our hearts in purity, in truth. And that means we have to look around us at every moment and every day and see if we are compromising ourselves with the big lie, with wokeness, with whatever the big lie is, because we have that moral responsibility. This is what Solzhenitsyn was trying to tell us, and this also is what the Czech dissident Václav Havel was trying to tell us, that uh, we do not have to submit to these lies. We may end up losing our jobs, losing our freedom, losing everything around us, but as long as we stand firm in the truth, then we will ultimately prevail. Maybe not in our lifetime, but in the lifetime of our children. And uh, what this, is, this really is, is a call to moral responsibility. And this ultimately goes back to live not by lies. What uh, Solzhenitsyn and what Havel later were trying to do was to address people who had no political power, who had no economic power under Soviet communism. But he was trying to tell them, you are not defeated. As long as you know what the truth is and are willing to live in the truth and suffer, even die for the truth, then truth will ultimately prevail. But if you allow the lie to corrupt you, if you go along to get along and, and rationalize this out by saying, well, you know, I need to hold on to my position so I can do good later, ultimately that lie will corrupt you. And that is the one thing that you do have control over. A lot of important thoughts in there. Rod Dreher, thank you so much. The book is called Live Not By Lies. Rod Dreher, I, I've got to learn how to pronounce your last name properly. You're doing Rod great. Dreer, am I saying it right? I, I appreciate so much you having time for making time for us today and chatting with you with us. Thank you again. Thank you, Stuart. All right. And if you appreciate uh, the efforts to protect our religious freedom in the country, First Liberty Institute is, of course, is an organization uh, devoted to protecting and preserving religious freedom for all Americans. Your support, you can be part of this. If that's an outcome you'd like to see in the real world, uh, just go to FirstLibertyLive.com and click on the big red Give button. And let me just say thank you in advance for your support. We will be back next week right here on First Liberty Live.